All right, you can go ahead, Gary. I'd like to welcome everyone who's joining us today. I know we'll be joined by more. We're just now getting started with uh, the AICP exam review session for the AICP Code of Ethics and Professional Conduct. And uh, I'm sure that we'll have plenty of things to go through. As a brief introduction of myself, uh, I'm a member of my fellow and member of AICP with a 40 year career in planning, mostly in Metro Atlanta. And I was formerly the professional development officer for Georgia Planning Association. I'm presently retired and happy to be that retired, uh, including my duties as professional development officer, now being carried out very well by Christina Pastore. And with the help of Beth Ann Trombetta, we're going to be jumping into AICP Code of Ethics here. So the first thing we might think about is why is it important to have a code of ethics? And certainly over the years, it's proven that planners can put themselves in the public spotlight. And sometimes there are issues in the public interest for which uh, a planner's behavior becomes an, an element of credibility. Uh, and we want to make sure that everyone who is a member of AICP is very familiar with uh, the precedence of uh, supporting the public interest, and that must come first, whether we're in, especially if we're in, public, in the public sector, not to support so much just the political side of uh, our professional duties, but to perform rather with emphasis on the public interest. And if we're in the private sector, and I was in the private sector for at least 15 years, we have to deal with uh, the conflict between profit in uh, the public interest and trying to avoid those conflicts of interest in our own professional practice. So you'll find that the code of ethics for AICP is among the best in all the professions um, that have ethics codes and others look at our uh, code of ethics as a model for their own. So um, I hope you'll take the time to uh, become very familiar with it and comfortable with it and it has a lot to offer. The first thing you'll notice is that it's divided into five sections, and that's really in two major parts. Section A and B are uh, pretty much the substance of the Code of Ethics, and uh, Section C, D, and E are primarily the procedure. And I'm gonna go through each of these in, individually here, so we can talk about what's actually in these sections. You add it all together, it's uh, over 20 pages of a lot of text, and some of it's pretty difficult to read. So take your time and read it once or twice at least, uh, and then think about what the, the key issues are that might show up on the exam. So section A is primarily the statement of principles to which we aspire. And those are the we shall kinds of, uh, portions of this code. They're the foundation for the entire code. Uh, it provides the shared values and the basis or foundation for the rules which are contained in section B. You really have to put A and B together uh, and, and consider them as a whole. The section B, uh, the rules of conduct, apply to all members of AICP. Whereas section A is just an overall statement that is intended to inspire and guide the entire planning process and everyone who participates in it. But section B applies specifically to members of the AICP, uh, American Institute of Certified Planners. And it's something for which we are held accountable and can potentially be charged with misconduct and suffer uh, discipline if we fail to comply. So it's very important that we look carefully at each of these rules. And uh, <laughs> a little bit to my disdain, they're all like the Ten Commandments. You might say, we shall not this and that. Whereas Section A, the principles are more like we shall 
do these things or aspire to them. Section C contains a discussion of the various forms of advisory opinions which are available. Uh, we have informal advisory opinions that are available from the ethics officer that uh, can be posed as questions. You can pose questions to the ethics officer and ask for an informal opinion. Uh, anyone can do this, in, including the uh, participants in the planning process who are not members of ASDP. Whereas the, the formal advisory opinions are issued uh, with written requests and are replied to with written requests. Um, in some cases, uh, ASDP may publish those opinions where they feel like it's an overall uh, ethical issue that needs to be um, shared with everybody in the profession. Section D has to do with uh, the procedures of the complaint and the adjudication of misconduct uh, and the process and the role of the AICP ethics officer and the AICP ethics committee as they try to rule on or resolve ethics complaints against certified planners. Section E is, uh, contains a discussion of the forms of discipline that may be used. And the idea here is that the discipline is some way proportionate to the scale of the misconduct or the type of misconduct. Uh, so there's considerably, we'll go over that in a few minutes. And the final section of the code, which is a new idea with the new code that was just recently adopted, is a glossary of some of the more pertinent uh, words and phrases that give us a better understanding of what the code is really supposed to mean. So the principles to which we aspire, which is in section A, again are shall, we shall, those who participate, not just the AICP members, but everyone, the public, the elected officials, the planning commission, uh, everyone, all the planners, and all who come as members of the public to participate in the planning process, to continuously pursue and faithfully serve the public interest, public interest, and, and we'll talk about that at more length soon. Do that with integrity, what is integrity? We'll talk about that, transparency and such. Work to achieve economic, social, and racial equity. There's quite a bit on that in the glossary too. And to safeguard the public trust. Fifth, the practicing planners shall improve planning knowledge and increase public understanding of planning activities. And so all of these are proactive uh, views of how Planning, the planning process should be conducted. And AICP members should be leading that process in accordance with these principles. First, continuously pursue and faithfully serve the public interest. Again, what's the public interest? Well, it's spelled out down here fairly well, understanding our own biases and privileges so that we can better truly, truly serve uh, the public interest in a complete manner. Be conscious of the rights of others, especially underrepresented communities and marginalized people. And that is spelled out further in the glossary. Having special concern for long range consequences of our plans and actions and decisions. Recognizing the interrelatedness of decisions and the unintended consequences. Incorporating equity principles and strategies and overcoming impediments to racial and social equity. And this is not a passive position. This is saying we should be working proactively to incorporate equity and uh, overcome impediments to equity in our communities through the planning process. And that we should critically analyze ethical issues and apply ethical procedure in the practice of planning. In other words, these ethical principles are not here to just sit on a shelf but we should be asking ourselves all the time how well we're performing in that relation to each of these principles and what can we do to apply them in the actual planning process that's going on day to day in our community. So these are pretty lofty uh, aspirations, 
what they expect us to take very practical measures to implement. Principles to which we aspire include participating in the planning process with integrity. So what is integrity? Well, it spells it out here. Providing timely, adequate, clear, accessible, and accurate information. Take care of that one because it becomes the first rule that's stated down in section B. Facilitating the exchange of ideas to ensure informed participation of underrepresented communities and marginalized people. Facilitating the exchange of ideas. Okay? Promoting excellence in design, utilizing principles of sustainability. Identifying human and environmental consequences of alternative action. So planning is not just a straight line process. Of, oh, here's the problem, bang, here's the answer. But really, we have to back up and think about the consequences and devise alternative actions to try and minimize the negative consequences of our planning and analyzing whether we've actually chosen a path that will minimize the undesired consequences. Enhancing our professional education and training. You're doing that right now. Good for you. Educating and seeking to empower the public about the relevance of planning issues. Describing the work of other professionals in a fair and professional manner. That's something to take note of. Respecting the rights of all persons and groups without discrimination. That's a big talk. Number three, work to achieve economic, social, and racial equity by creating plans that ensure equitable access to resources and eliminating historic patterns of inequity, trying to eliminate those historic patterns. That's a big job uh, in zoning and land use plan decisions. Seeking social justice by expanding choice for all persons and planning with those who have been marginalized or disadvantaged. That is to take extra effort to include those people. Mitigating the impact of existing plans that result in patterns of discrimination. Supporting equitable supply of affordable housing and services. Promote the inherent rights of indigenous people and work with them on developments affecting them in their lands and resources. All of these are really strong admonitions Give us a lot to think about and a lot to do. But we're not done. Safeguarding the public trust. This has to do more with our professional and uh, interpersonal relations in the process. Dealing fairly with all participants, exercising fair, honest, skilled, and independent professional judgment, not letting official actions be influenced by our personal relationship only serving clients whose objectives are consistent with the public interest. That's a big one, and I've thought about that a lot. That can be a, a real cliffhanger in some situations. Avoiding actual or apparent conflicts of interest in accepting assignments. Publicly disclosing personal and pecuniary interests regarding planning decisions and leave any chamber in which this matter is being considered you're the subject of the possible conflict of interest. So that's uh, something that comes up often. The conflict of interest matter is discussed in much more detail in Part B. Not accept, accepting gifts or, or favors intended to influence our decision. Not accepting assignments for which you cannot render diligent services. Not deliberately committing an act that reflects adversely on the planning process. It doesn't say planning profession, it says planning process. Not seeking business by offering to influence decisions by improper means and exposing corruption wherever discovered. Wow, okay. Number five, practicing planners must improve planning knowledge and public understanding by Improving public knowledge and techniques, sharing work, your work that contributes to the body of planning knowledge, share it with other planners. CPA is a great way to do this. Participate in a, in a panel discussion or one of our uh, programs at uh, fall conference. Examining applicability of planning knowledge 
the facts of each situation, not applying customary solutions to the situations where they're not applicable. Striving to achieve high standards of education and professionalism and complying with CM requirements, that certification maintenance. That's what you will be doing after you become a member of AICP to maintain your status in AICP. Expanding the recognition of AICP and FAICP credentials and its members. Contributing time and resources to professional development of yourself and others who are members of underrepresented groups. Contributing pro bono time and resources to communities lacking planning resources. And usually the National Conference of APA has one or two uh, workshops that are set up in the community where that's hosting the, the APA conference, the National Conference, in which planners are invited to take part and share their skill and, and capabilities with some community in the, in the neighborhood around where the conference is located to uh, help a planning issue be better uh, pursued and uh, perhaps even develop a plan, a usable plan for a community that didn't have the money to pay for a plan. Section B, this is our rules of conduct, which we adhere and understand we're subject to discipline if we don't adhere to that. Uh, those include the following. Quality, integrity, of, and integrity of practice. Again, you can see that was reflected in the, the principles, but now we've got some rules. Conflict of interest, I mentioned some of that. Improper influence or abuse of your position. Honesty and fair dealing, that would be mostly with the public as well as other employees and people with whom you work. Responsibility to your employer, termination or harassment that is not accepted, bringing a charge, you know, lack of cooperation with ethics officer in the case that you are involved either as uh, someone against whom a complaint has been lodged or someone who has been asked to provide evidence or information related to such a, a charge of misconduct. So, to start with quality and integrity of practice. And again, here's where it's shall not. You shall not deliberately fail to provide adequate, timely, clear, and accurate information on planning issues. Again, that was reflected in one of the principles. You shall not accept an assignment that is illegal or violates this code. We shall not accept work beyond our professional competence. That can cause you some thought, you know, if you're asked to do something you're a specialist in some area and you're asked to do some professional work that really is outside of your area of competence, you should defer and recommend someone else who could do it uh, with competence. Accept work, don't accept work that cannot be performed as promptly as required. Your time from delivering the product. Make analysis of findings, shall not make an analysis of findings not supported by available evidence or deliberately commit any wrongful act that reflects adversely on our professional fitness or the planning profession. And note that there was a similar phrase or similar principle, but it talked about the planning process. This one talks about the planning profession. In terms of conflict of interest, we shall not accept additional compensation for that goes beyond what our B or other salary was related to our public office of employment. We shall not perform work that results in direct personal or financial gain other than compensation from our employer, unless our employer knows and agrees, and we make full disclosure on the public record in every public meeting and report related to the assignment. Um, and that's a diligence that we need to help each other uh, perform. And disclosure is one of the principles that follows in all the conflict of interest cases. That, that one of the number one things we should do if, if we see a possible uh, perception of conflict of interest is 
disclose what the true situation is uh, so that it, it, there is a conflict of interest and you're performing uh, under that cloud, so to speak, that everyone is fully aware of that. We shall not, as public decision makers, engage in private communications with planning process participants. Obviously, we have public hearings, and the intent of this rule is to say the decision makers, the ones who are making the final decision, need to base their decision based on the public information that has been provided, either in reports that have been made public or in the public hearings uh, provided in the planning process by planning process participants. Engage, we shall not engage in private communication with decision makers. If we're the planner, they're the decision maker, where it is prohibited by law or agency rules and procedures. This has to do with the ex parte communication, which sometimes is an issue, uh, but it's not illegal in Georgia. Has to be done under the principles of that and disclosure. Solicit shall not solicit clients or employment with false and misleading claims, nor imply an ability to improperly influence decisions, nor shall we use the power of our office to seek special advantage that is not public knowledge or in public interest. Honest and fair dealing. Next rule, set of rules, we shall not disclose or use confidential information contrary to the interests of a client or employer except when required by law or to prevent substantial injury to the public. That should also be carefully considered. Deliber we shall not deliberately misrepresent qualifications or the views or findings of other professionals shall not misstate our own qualifications. We shall not use another's professional work to seek credit for ourselves, nor conceal the interests of our client or employer in the planning process. That takes a little thought too. What are the interests of your client or employer? Are we acting in a way that conceals that in order to deceive people? If we gain influence, case, then we're violating one of these important rules. We shall not accept a second job outside our current employment without full written disclosure to and permission from our employer. That's moonlight trick. Make sure you have permission from your employer if you need to do this. And take a, shall not take a second job. It creates a conflict of interest with the first. We shall not publicly advocate a position on a planning issue that's different from one that we previously advocated, but during the last three years for a previous employer, unless we make full written disclosure to our previous and current employer. We've changed our minds because there's new facts, new information, sometimes because of evolving technology. Uh, I know of a planner who started to say at one point in his career, that he did not support the idea of manufactured housing in the community. And later, the manufactured housing changed a lot. And he found himself needing to advocate that that manufactured housing be uh, incorporated into the community. Uh, and the reason was that a lot of things had changed. Uh, they weren't the same kinds of units that had been manufactured years Discrimination and harassment is also uh, one of the rules. We shall not commit or ignore. We shall not commit or ignore an act of discrimination or harassment. And that is a term that's described more fully in the glossary. So now we're starting to look at how these uh, can be implemented in terms of uh, the effects of the ethics officer uh, and our participation in complaints that might be filed. Uh, this might apply to you as someone to whom 
a complaint was filed, or if you've been asked to provide evidence or information to the ethics office in order to substantiate or refute a charge, then we shall not withhold that cooperation information if we have the information relevant relevant information that's been requested and is obviously needed. We shall not harass, retaliate, or threaten someone who's filed a charge against us uh, or someone who's provided evidence to an ethics investigation that it may be contrary to our position. We shall not threaten to file charges against another planner for personal, pecuniary, or professional gain or file a meritless complaint. We don't use the complaint system as a form of retribution or harassment of another planner. Nor shall we fail to notify the ethics officer if we are convicted of a serious crime. And I'll go over that a little bit later. It's defined in section E3 of the code. So now we're into the rules of procedure, uh, sections parts C, D, and E. We'll go through those. The advisory opinions are covered in section C. Two forms of advisory opinion. Anyone in the planning process can request an informal opinion from the ethics officer of informal advice based on the AICP code and someone's questions or concerns about what it means. Anyone can ask for that informal advice and the ethics officer will provide it within 30 days. And then an AICP member may get a formal advisory opinion. Um, and that formal opinion um, usually based on a written request and is considered carefully and given for the ethics committee to respond. And the ethics committee from time to time might issue opinions to ethical matters related to planning and publish those opinions uh, that they feel like need to be expressed to everyone in, in the planning process. Section D has to do with how are these complaints adjudicated? What is the process? Uh, and what are the, who does what as the complaints are filed, uh, those complaints get filed to the ethics office. And it's really the, uh, the first five steps are primarily the role of the ethics office in reviewing the facts, requesting information, uh, asking for witnesses and others who can provide corroborating information in one way or the other, whether a particular thing took place or whether that particular act was an act of misconduct. So there has to be a lot of fact gathering. The first thing that the ethics officer wants to do is to reach a settlement. If someone's complaining about the conduct of a member of AICP, the ethics officer would like to be able to resolve that without going deeply into serious forms of sentence. So an informal settlement sometimes reached with a letter of apology or some other simple means by which the person who's complaining feels their issue has been satisfied or resolved. If that can, cannot be done, then a decision will be necessary. And that decision uh, starts with the, usually starts with a hearing, uh, having an information hearing, including people who may be witnesses and ask to provide the information. This may take place in a uh, confidential or non-confidential situation, depending on how the ethics office considers the situation. Of course, nobody is trying to uh, publicize misconduct, but in some cases it's necessary in order for the, the facts to come out and be properly understood. The decision is then made about whether the person who is accused of some misdeeds is guilty or not, and what sort of penalty would be uh, would result from a guilty charge, and that 
decision may also be to say, no, there was nothing uh, ethical uh, misconduct involved in what happened. It did not violate the code of ethics. In either case, there can be an appeal, but the appeal can only be made by a member of AICP. So if you're a member of AICP and uh, the subject of a complaint, you have the right to appeal. But if someone who complains against your behavior is then uh, informed that that was not misconduct under the code, they don't have the right to appeal unless the complainant is also a member of AICP. Uh, so it's also possible that the, um, the person who initially complained will decide to drop the charges. Uh, and if they drop the charges, then the AICP commission may decide one way or the other whether they want to continue to want to prosecute this charge in, in order to find a, an opinion that will be helpful to the profession or to just drop it and, and let it go since the charges are, are no longer coming from the complainant public or whatever, then should AICP pursue it on separate grounds or not. Or the, the planner who was the subject of that uh, charge may decide to resign in order to avoid being disciplined. Uh, and in those circumstances, they may do that, but the decision may still be rendered by the commission. And there's a period of time in which they can under certain circumstances, be readmitted to AICP. Now, all of that's spelled out in Section D. And finally, reporting, and that is that the opinion of the AICP Ethics Committee might be published, or should be published, and made uh, a record so that that information is available. The appeal itself, uh, as I said, either complainant or respondent may appeal. 30 days for notice, another 14 days for a statement of appeal, and 30 days for the other party to respond. And then if that appeal is also made by an AICP member, then there'll be a decision by the Ethics Committee whether to reverse or sustain the original decision or modify it in some way. Section E is uh, more depth into the actual discipline of members. And as I said, they, the discipline can be proportionate and should be uh, to the severity of the misconduct. But one thing you should notice is that if any of us who are AICP members are convicted of serious crime, then we're supposed to self-report uh, that crime to the AICP ethics office. In many cases, will result in the revocation of your AICP status. And that would be if you committed a serious crime, such as false swearing, fraud, misrepresentation, failure to file a tax return, deceit, bribery, extortion, misappropriation, theft, or physical harm to another. And these are serious crimes for which there was conviction by a civil body court. So um, these aren't just in the opinion of the ethics officer. These are actual uh, crimes that are on the public record uh, of misbehavior. Also, uh, conduct that may result in discipline, other unethical conduct, uh, in accordance with the opinions of the ethics officer identified in the, the facts and discipline process that we've already reviewed can result in a law suspension or restriction of profession. I'm sorry. Now, if you are you have a professional license by a government agency, I think New Jersey has a license for uh, planners. But if they take your license away uh, for some reason, then that may result in discipline from AICP as well. You can also receive discipline for failure to make disclosure uh, of a conviction of a serious crime, which I explained, or an 
adverse professional license action or other unethical action determined by the public health political ethics committee. The forms of discipline go all the way from uh, the loss of your AICP status, to, beginning with a confidential letter of admonition or a public letter of admonition saying this person has done things you consider to be unethical, for which we expect them to make some kind of restitution, attempt some kind of uh, resolution to the complainant. Suspension of your AICP membership, uh, which would be for a period of time, perhaps six months or a year. Uh, revocation, which is more of a final act of uh, removing you from AICP. There are, there may be accompanied, these actions may be accompanied by a condition such as asking you to write a letter of apology, correct false statements, uh, take an ethics course, uh, refund money if that was. These procedures do apply, uh, allow for appeal uh, and petition for reinstatement after five years of suspension. If you lose your AICP membership, you can't come back after five years with an appeal. So these are the terms that are found in the uh, end of the AICP Code of Ethics. Diversity, equity, environmental injustice. I thought it was going to say justice, but environmental injustice. Harassment, whether it's verbal or written or physical or visual, like using hand signals to represent harassment. Um, historic patterns of inequity. That's defined. Uh, inclusion. And that has to do with people of all types being included in the planning process. Uh, indigenous people, privilege, what is the privilege that we have in our society that other people are denied uh, unjustly? And what, kind, what is social justice? And what is a substantial injury, which is also used as a term in uh, one of the things that some of the procedures and the, I'm sorry, concerning the adjudication of complaints. So what are some of the key tensions? And uh, in my view, all of us as planners are in a constant tension between the public interest that we are supposed to serve with priority and precedent versus the objectives of our clients. Sometimes our clients are public. Sometimes our clients are elected officials. Sometimes those elected officials are responsible for the public. Sometimes, however, we get put in situations where it would not appear that our client is pursuing the public interest and we're supposed to do so anyway. That puts us in quite a bit of tension and stress. I've been personally involved in that situation where I was a planning director and a new commissioner. He was pretty naive. After three months of service on the board of commissioners came and asked me to rezone his own personal property. And I explained the process. We needed a land use plan amendment, public hearings, and reports, and an application and a fee. And his view was, why should I have to do that? I'm your commissioner. Don't you know who you work for? Just take care of it. <laughs> and it put me in a substantial <laughs> tension with that uh, particular person who's an elected official and officially my boss. And he said, don't you know who you work for? But I work for the whole commission, not individual commissioners and their personal interests. I have to serve the public interest. So these kind of things may happen to you or may have already happened in your experience as a planner. We often have a choice about how we're going to provide information to the public. Um, and if we aren't taking careful regard for people who don't have the same access 
interesting information. We may leave some people out of the planning process uh, and yet feel that there's nothing more we can do. There are impacts on the environment and equity, which are always in front of us, but sometimes those uh, decisions may have an adverse effect on the environment, but a positive effect on social equity. So what's the better solution? And we're having to resolve those questions using what technical skills we have, facts and information, but also relying on the principles of our code of ethics. There are obviously situations where your client's interest and your personal advantage may be in conflict. It's easy to take a report that you've already written and tell another client, you'll do a similar project for them and then basically reproduce the report, change just a few pieces of information and you're done. But again, is that an adequate response to the client's interest? And have you fully considered how these two assignments were different and their context was different. Um, we've also been in the situation where recommendations are changed. Well, that can be a real matter of ethical conflict. I remember working on a transportation project where we had alternative alignment and uh, with the technical process identified the preferred alternative. Well, a very important person uh, in, of national stature was affected by this and put pressure on our elected officials that, well, that wasn't the right decision. And ultimately, the elected officials decided to change the recommendation submitted by the staff in a technical report. We were told to incorporate that recommendation in the final report, but the whole report read very strangely because it seemed to tilt towards one uh, alternative and in the end it flipped to a different alternative. That was before <laughs> we had an ASDP code of ethics, but it's an example of something that happens frequently and you probably experienced it or will in your career. Getting to the exam, Questions are not just about, and many of them, they may not be so much about exactly what the wording of one of these uh, standards of conduct is, but more importantly, applying it to some situation. Uh, so like I just said a minute ago, when asking you to make a judgment about whether or not the rule applies or the principle involves a particular kind of Behavior in the positive way, and you have to consider the facts uh, and what the appropriate answer would be from among a series of possible answers, which is the best. And obviously, you don't want to do this based on how you think your boss or client would want you to do it, but really try to prioritize values that are in the public interest, and that's what the code of ethics is trying to, to instruct us to do in the exam be very true to that idea of trying to, to let you see the implications, but to claim the alternative that's in the public interest, particularly if it deals with a decision that protects environmental sustainability, includes inclusiveness and diversity of uh, the beneficiaries of our planning work, that it furthers social justice, and that it demonstrates professional integrity and includes full disclosure of any ethical conflicts or issues that are embedded in the work or in your performance of work. So those are the kinds of questions you should expect in the exam, not just the wording of one of the rules. And of course, don't forget to study the procedures. It's actually a lot of complex detail in the procedure. So read that carefully and make notes and think about uh, how the process works when you're going through an ethical complaint and it's being resolved and what the uh, principles of that decision might be and what might be the consequences. Uh, the, 
informal advice versus formal advice, and the roles of the AICP ethics officer versus the ethics commission. At one point, does the ethics commission committee get involved in furthering the outcome of the complaint? And I will stop now and see if you have some questions that I can help you answer. I see from the chat. No, that wasn't a question. We will get started right at 2.30, okay. If you have other questions, you wanna put them in the chat, you may do so. Otherwise, I'll go on down here and talk, show you some examples of questions and these are not questions that are taken directly from the exam, but just examples of what you might see, suggestions of the kind of questions. Um, where would you file a charge of misconduct against an AICP member or to whom? Would you file it to the local chapter of the American Planning Association, that's the Georgia chapter? Would you file it to the ethics officer designated by the AICP commission? Would you file it to the president of the American Planning Association? Or would you file it to the president of the American Institute of Certified Planners? This is maybe the easiest one, but it's important to remember that the ethics officer is designated uh, by the AICP commission and uh, you can direct, send your the charge of misconduct that happened would come directly to the ethics officer, that individual. Uh, don't take it to the professional development officer. Christina doesn't have the authority or really want to get involved in uh, giving you opinions or uh, charge of dealing with a charge of misconduct if this comes up. Um, the professional development officer is just here to help you get professional development, not to get in the middle of an ethics controversy. The city's, here's another. Example, the city's planning director resigned in order to pursue a career with a small consulting firm. She was fed up with one of the planning board members and recalcitrant and obstructed him. And that planning board member ran against her. And the, no, the, I'm sorry, the planning director ran against the planning board member in the next public election for the planning board and to beat her decisively. Which of the following choices apply? And was the planning director resigned in order to run as a public, uh, in a public election against one of the other members of the planning board, one of the members of the planning board? So does this violate the AICP code of ethics that the planning director resigned and succeeded a member of the planning board in the next election. Uh, I think it possibly violate the code of ethics. Uh, it would not violate the code of ethics or you need more information. Well, in our opinion, the answer is it does not violate the ACP code of ethics. It is possible for a planning director, a member of the planning staff to resign they want to, to uh, enter an election and, and, and become a public official themselves. Uh, there's nothing unethical about that. Obviously, there are ways that you can do this in a, <laughs> poorly or well, and we want you to do your best and uh, maintain your integrity. But if you're elected officially and legally, then there's no reason you can't participate as uh, an elected official in the planning process. So here's another one. The rules of conduct, AICP code include the following, and, I, and there are four choices. We shall not as public officials or employees accept from anyone other than our public employer any compensation, commission, rebate, or other advantage that may be perceived as related to our public office or employment. Two, we shall not seek employment for which we are not competent to perform, including elected public office. Three, we shall deal fairly with all participants in the planning process. Those of us who are public officials or employees shall also deal even handedly with all planning process participants. Four, we shall not file a 
frivolous charge of ethical misconduct against another planet. So which one of these are more than one, obviously, uh, a part of the rules of conduct? And uh, the answer, in our opinion, is C, which includes one, three, and four, but does not include two. We shall not seek employment for which we're not competent to perform, including elected public office. And as we sort of discussed in the previous questions, uh, no one's implying that a planner is not competent to run for elected public office. And in fact, we have one in, in DeKalb County, and uh, he's done a, a great job, uh, but his career has been planning. Resigned from that career in order to, to become an, an elected official. And that's not unethical. Admirable. Okay. Next. The rules of conduct, AICP code state, shall not accept an assignment from a client or employer to publicly advocate a position on a planning issue that's significantly different from a position we publicly advocate for a previous client or employer within the past three years, unless we do what? Our latest opinion agrees with the official position of the American Planning Association. Is that relevant? We determine in good faith that our change of position will not cause present detriment to our previous client or employer. We pay the previous client to sign an affidavit releasing us from the previously stated opinion and agreeing with the revised D, we make full written disclosure of the conflict to our current client and employer and receive written permission to proceed with the assignment. And E is only items B and B. That's probably obvious. That's the right answer. We want to make sure that we determine in good faith that the change of position will not cause present detriment to our previous client. And that we make a full written disclosure of the conflict to our current client or employer and receive written permission to proceed with that assignment. I think this is the last one. Sample question. As the senior planner in the town's planning department, James argued successfully against any further non residential development within the town's recharge area for its public wealth. Five years later, as a consultant to a national shopping mall developer, now James is aggressively pursuing a rezoning of a thousand acres of land that are within the town's public water supply recharge area. Now, we don't know all the facts, but obviously he's changed his opinion dramatically. So according to the AICP Code of Ethics and Professional Conduct, which of the following choices apply? It definitely violates. AICP Code of Ethics. It possibly violates the AICP Code of Ethics. It does not violate the AICP Code of Ethics, or you have insufficient information. Well, the facts are it doesn't violate the AICP Code of Ethics for one reason, and that is this change of opinion or position rather, came after five years. Code of Ethics said, if you change your position within three years, then you have to go through the previous hoops of trying to resolve any effects it may have on your previous client and get disclosure and permission to you know, approval, I guess, from your previous client that this is now acceptable. So you have to justify it. Uh, but since it's five years later, no longer matters according to the Code of Ethics. Now, that doesn't mean there's not some other aspects of facts related to the situation that could have been an ethical conflict. We don't know. So you could al almost say B, but it's so clearly not in there because of the five years later that uh, you say it does not violate the code. So finally, the words of advice are be calm. There's a lot of material in here. Uh, there's a lot of things that could be made of it, uh, but if you study hard, you'll see the bigger picture. And trust me, the 
the ASCP exam is not trying to trip you up. It's simply trying to make sure that you have studied hard and that you are thoughtfully uh, informed and aware of uh, what the code provides and how to apply it in the situation. So I'll stop again to see if there are other questions that people want to put into the chat box. If Beth Ann has any other questions that come her way. I haven't received any other questions um, during the presentation. But we'll give everybody a second if they want to put anything in the chat box or unmute yourself if you would like to ask a question. Um, yeah. until, until we have that, I did want to let everybody know um, that we scheduled this morning the leadership administration and management review session for Monday, April 25th at 1 p.m. So we will be um, getting that added to the website if you want to sign up for that one. Um, again, our next presentation is going to be um, on Tuesday, the 19th at 10 a.m. And you'll be receiving that link on Monday, the 18th. And if you are participating in the spring meeting next week, the conference, the virtual sessions are on the 24th, or, I'm sorry, the 21st, on um, Thursday, the 21st, and the mobile workshops are on the 22nd. Registration will be open for both of those um, through Tuesday. So if you are planning to attend those and have not registered, please go so, go ahead and do that um, online. I don't see any other questions. Also, I'd also like to share my email address, gary, G-A-R-Y dot Cornell, zero one at gmail.com. And if any of you have any questions that come up later in your study or review of the AICP Code of Ethics, professional conduct, and you want to ask me about those questions, send them. I'll be glad to try to respond. I, I'm not the eminent uh, expert on this. As stated in the code, it goes back to the ASDP ethics officer, but I think from my experience with the exam and uh, other people like you and trying to take it, I can try to be of help. All right, well, no other questions. We will go ahead and end this session. Gary, thank you so much for your participation and this session uh, recording in Gary's PowerPoint, uh, a PDF of that will be posted on the GPA website in the next couple of days. Thank you so much. Thank you, Beth. Goodbye.